Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Steve, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you. Great to be with you, Kerry. Yeah, I, I had so much fun last time, so I'm just really excited to be with you. Well, you helped a lot of leaders, myself included. And here we are a year into the pandemic. And the world is not back to normal, and you have spent a lot of time, particularly over the last year, helping people manage leadership anxiety and the anxiety that global crisis presents. So I kind of want to do a recap. Now that we're a year in, what would you say the, the top symptoms you were dealing with in leaders have been over the last year? Just so people can get some framework and go, oh, yeah, that, that's exactly what I was dealing with. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've talked to a ton of leaders or I should say probably listened to a ton of leaders and yeah, yeah there there are some common themes. So, you know, one of them is ambiguity. Um mm. so, you know, as as you know, Kerry, one of the things I do is study the dynamics of anxiety because it's such a big word that if we can break it down into the things that cause anxiety, it can yeah. help us. Ambiguity will always make you anxious. Uh also mm. known as anytime you don't know what to do. Anytime you're in a situation where you don't know what to do, I don't care how you're wired. Like I'm a pretty confident looking guy, but put me in a situation where I don't know what to do and I'm a leader, I'm supposed to do something, I'm going to be anxious. So ambiguity has been huge. I, I think the the trifecta of racial injustice, COVID, and at least in the United States, political strife, those three, yeah. you know, for any faith leader particularly, but even business leader, if you have a diverse team or congregation or business, you're making decisions that people are seeing through those lenses. And so they're mm. projecting onto you their baggage. And that's going to make you anxious. Anytime you feel misunderstood or as a leader, you don't feel seen, uh, it's going to generate anxiety. Mm. And then that, the, the, the criticism would be the third. I've, I've listened to so many leaders who just can't take one more critic and it's because, and I think this is unique to churches. There's something I think unique in the people who attend a church for a while think that means they know how to lead a church. And so they're just very free to tell the leader what the leader should do. And you know, those would be three, uh, man, a lot of leaders running on empty right now. So I want to double click on a couple of those, but let's go to uh, criticism because that is a big deal. And I've talked to some some leaders who, you know, in normal times, very stable. They they handle it. They lead a lot of stuff and they're used to their share of critics. But I've gotten some emergency texts from friends who are like, yeah. if one more person criticizes me, like, dude, I just, I don't know whether I can do this anymore. Like, this is nuts. Like the level, and particularly, I don't know whether you saw this or not, and this is not a political statement, but the partisanship around November, 2020, it seemed, that seemed to leak out all over the place. And that's when I probably saw that peak. And did you see that as well? Like, I don't want <laughs> yeah. to know. I don't want to say it's better yet because I think people love being critical. But like, was there like an epoch to that around the election? Yes, I, I agree with you. I think there was. And I, I actually think uh, understanding anxiety explains it because anxiety spreads in any group. And uh. the more anxious the leader is, the more anxious the group is. And so mm. the, the, the general rule of anxiety is the most anxious person in any room has the most power in that room. And people have seen that, like if you're in a small group and there's always that same person that's always needy and down, mm -hmm. you can see everybody in that small group kind of suddenly putting all their energy to that needy or, person. Or some of us tune them out maybe. Anyway, no, never mind. That's unhealthy. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you just say that out loud? I think you did. I think I did um, say that out loud. Yeah. But, you know, mm -hmm. again, if, if we dismiss political policy and just look at personality, mm -hmm. the U.S. president was most of the time the most anxious person in any room. And his anxiety spread to not just his followers, but everybody. 
And again, uh, I wish he had a different political affiliation so people wouldn't hear that right. as a They wouldn't hear it comment. as a Democrat-Republican thing, but they would just That's say not what it is. there was someone who was very anxious in the White House. Extremely anxious. One of the most anxious people ever. So in that would, Okay, leadership. that's a very different take on Donald Trump than I've ever heard. So let's yeah. go there. What, what uh, made you... Yeah. No, no, no. Let's, make you, let, let's talk about what makes you diagnose that from afar as anxiety. Yeah, so you can watch anxiety spread and now you can watch it dissipating. Like it's mm. not that our problems have gone away. Yeah. It's that people have calmed down about the problems that exist. Right. And when President Trump would speak, he would escalate the problem to an anxious and reactive state. So what you're looking for in anxiety is reactivity. Right. And, and we all generally know after the fact when we were reactive what I just try to train people is to over time learn how to notice it in the moment and then preemptively. So every one of us would know how to push the president's buttons to get a reaction out of him. Right. And he doesn't manage his reactivity. You might even say he actually wields it or inflicts it on people. Uh, and so if we, if we take it away from politics, because I know that is such a red flag for people. Yeah, there's already but, angry comments coming in. So Yeah, yeah. Right. And I'll just forward them to you. But, yeah, um, you. but most of us have worked for a boss like this. Yes. Most of us are related to somebody like this. So what I do, I train people to notice anxiety in a group and pay attention not to what people are saying, but the way people are reacting to each other. And uh, that's, that's kind of how you can lead. It's like a leading in a whole other gear. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I can I can look back on my own leadership to be self-reflective and self-critical yeah. and say there were times where maybe things weren't going well at home or uh, I was really frustrated and I show up to a staff meeting and you're saying that anxiety spreads. Yes, and unfortunately, the higher up you are in the power, the more your anxiety impacts your group. And that's why it's so important for key leaders of organizations to be the one that worked most on their own anxiety. So step number one, Kerry, is just how do you know when you're anxious? And it's mm. interesting when I ask, I mean, I've asked now thousands of leaders that question. It's interesting how few of us actually know when we're anxious and what makes us anxious until we have time to reflect and ask ourselves or sometimes we have to ask someone that loves us. Um, I'm coaching somebody right now. Uh, he's a, a business leader of a multi-million dollar business. And uh, he reached out because he's dealing with some anxiety pressure. And we got to the bottom of, okay, what's generating your anxiety? And he wasn't sure. And I was listening to him and I said, I, I want you to go home to your wife and just float the idea that maybe it's a control thing for you, that if you're not in control. And because for me, I, I don't, control is not a trigger for me. For me, it's approval. I want ah. people to like me. Or performance, I want to accomplish. Right. For him, it was control. Yeah. So we, we, met, we met a week later. I'm like, how did it go? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, uh, the, the worst thing about it was my wife was like, well, duh. Like she, she's known for years <laughs> what he didn't know. And so, yeah, for a leader to be able to know what makes them anxious, now you have a power tool to, to start to overcome it. But yeah, Kerry, I think we've all done that. We've all walked away yeah. saying, oh man, my poor team has carry the weight of my anxiety because I didn't manage it. So I want to go back to that because I think there are times what really surprised me, and again, please do not hear this as partisan or criticism of the former president or whatever. In four years of observing President Trump, I never thought of it as anxiety. Hmm. So that's really interesting. And then you go there and say, oh, no, he was anxious. Um, yeah. What makes you diagnose that? Because now it's making me think, oh, what do I think is an anxiety that is actually anxiety in me? So yeah. what makes you, from where right. you sit, observing what you observe, say, no, that would appear to me to be an anxious leader? That's a fantastic question because that, that reactivity, a lot of people, when they hear anxiety, they think worry and fear. Mm -hmm. And so then they, and so for example, since we are talking openly about the president, I would imagine that he would say, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not afraid of anything. Right. And therefore he would say, I'm not an anxious person. But if instead, if you look at chronic anxiety, that's the, that's the anxiety I deal in. Chronic anxiety is always generated after you don't get what you want or mm. more keenly, you don't get what you believe you actually need that you actually don't need. 
And so, for example, the president would never distinguish between picking a fight with a world leader like North Korea or a fairly un, like unpopular celebrity. He would pick an equal fight where he would demolish both. That's because he's in the grip of reactivity mm. because he needs to have the last word. He needs to be seen as a winner. And so anytime he's not, he doesn't look strong, he's now in the grip of anxiety. That's what I would say. Now, I'm obviously, I'm moving into territory, you know, I'm not a No, and maybe, maybe that's the end of that conversation and I appreciate you going there. But with the clients you've worked with, just to be clear, you haven't worked with the, yeah. the White House yet. Not yet. But, not yet. Yeah. But, um, and I'm, I'm not one to give in to, hey, I don't know that person, so I'm going to yeah. opine on them. So let's leave that, okay? It was just, yeah. it was just a new thought to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about leaders you've worked with, executives, senior pastors, et cetera. How would, how would anxiety manifest itself? Like for this guy, it was control is underneath it, yeah. right? And that would probably yeah. be my issue too. What would that look like in a meeting? Like I can tell you if I'm coming in agitated, that would be like, oh yeah, he's anxious. Or if I'm coming in, I, I'll give you an example. For me, and you can be my, my psychotherapist here. I would say, when I was unhealthy, I would walk into a meeting and make everybody work harder. It's like, okay, this is super urgent. Like we got to get this thing done. I'm not subtext. I'm not happy with the progress we're making. So, you know, Steve, get to work, (laughs) you know, Hey, get to work. Everybody, everybody double down. We got to do better than this. And that would be like an expression of my anxiety. Am I right in that? And yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anxiety can look really sophisticated. Sometimes it can look like uh, taking charge. Uh, mm. proactivity. Um, so I'll, I'll confess, since I've been accusing here, I'll start confessing my own sins. Um, when I was a hospital chaplain, where, as you know, I learned some of these early lessons, I up until that point, I'd always been um, rewarded or, or affirmed for my proactivity and my take charge nature. Mm. You know, in, in youth group and when I was a teenager and stuff, oh man, Steve's that guy that if no one knows what to do, he'll step in. So Therefore, I'm saying, oh, wow, what a gift. Look at this. Well, uh, here I am like in a room with, say, say five screaming people or, or f- people who are unhinged in shock with grief. Mm. I don't know what to do. And so I take charge. But what anxiety does is it stops you from being present and aware to what's actually going on. You're mm. no longer able to see what's actually going on. You're now infected by this kind of false lens and so the false lens I was infected by is, um, I don't. I, I must do something. Whereas really, with people in grief and shock, what you really do is you set your stopwatch for about three hours, and you work on your own need to do something, and you die to it, and you say, "I must be present," which is a lot of work. I don't mind saying, you you watch your average hospital chaplain, you think they're not doing anything. They are exhausted after mm. sitting fully present to what's going on. But so in a meeting then, what that looks like is if I don't know what to do or I have a need to have the last word in every meeting because I'm the lead pastor, Mm. uh, that is sometimes a gift and it's sometimes an anxious response. So, you know, what you gave me, Kerry, is not enough for me to go on. I mean, I've already kind of crossed the line with our beloved former president, but but in your case, it, it is this idea of your need for efficiency has maybe flooded your ability to see what's going on with those people or mm-hmm. what's really needed. I, but mm-hmm. only you can, you know, I'll say it. And then yeah, you no, that makes sense because it. I would approach it differently now on a good day. And it would be like, you know, rather than you are the problem, it's like we, we have a problem. Anyone have any ideas on how to solve this? Uh, any thoughts here? Okay, if we want to make progress in this area... What does that look like? So it's more like presenting the problem rather than just a quick solution that that wasn't helpful. Um, yeah. One, one of my key leaders yeah. came to me and it's several years ago now, and he says, hey, maybe you're not aware of this, but every time you want us to do something, it's always like you suddenly came up with it. Like it doesn't feel like there's any context to it. And then you need it done right away. <laughs> yes. And I was like, really? I had, And we'd worked together several years at this point. And I had to say to him, I had no idea that I'd do that. And of course, you know, tell me more. 
Now, what he was describing for me was an anxious response. And uh, what was going on in me is our church was growing rapidly. I was getting all kinds of things coming at me. And I was just trying to like delegate as quick as I could. But his experience of that was this, inst- everything for me is instantly urgent. Right. So now I, now I have insight and now I can lower my reactivity, be more present to him and say, hey, I want you to know I'm feeling so much pressure with everything coming at me. I need you to just take this off my plate. That's a different conversation than me just doing it. I don't know if that Ah, yeah, it it kind of signals self-awareness and then it opens it up for dialogue. Um, Let's go back to that scenario you you said in a small group or it could be a staff meeting or whatever, but a lot of us who lead are in charge and so we have our own anxiety, but sometimes you have that one staff member, that one team member who's like crisis a day, crisis a week, or they're always always anxious or we're not going to hit the numbers or whatever, whatever it happens to be. What is a, what is an unhelpful response to that person? And what is a more helpful response to that most anxious member of the group? Yeah. And sometimes it can look really sophisticated. Sometimes the anxious person is quiet Mm. and the few times they speak up, they own all the power in the room because they don't speak up much. (laughs) So what, what I train leaders to do, let's say it is a key leader what you have to do is is you have to pay as much attention to what's going on between people as you do to the agenda of the meeting. And that's hard mm. for driven leaders. We mm-hmm. want to kind of make progress. But this is a muscle we all have. It's just a bit flabby in some of us. It's what I call the process muscle. Never mind the content, what people are saying. Pay attention to what's going on in the room and you can see energy and anxiety spreading in any group. And so if you can notice the way somebody's comment impacts another person or the whole group. Now you have this like power tool Mm. and the simplest thing to do is to name it. Mm. Uh, If you can name it in a way that you're not being reactive. So like if you're really angry, you'd normally name it at the next meeting. (laughs) (laughs) You take the week to calm down and then you'd say, Hey, before we start, I want to go back to what happened here because you said this and you said this and I noticed the mood of the room changed. Did anyone else feel that? Now everyone felt it. But as the key leader, naming it gives everyone permission to talk about it. My experience is more often than not, the person that stepped on it is grateful to do some repair. That's Mm. been my overwhelming experience is the person who said something, they felt it too, but they don't know what to do with it. So as the leader, when you're saying, let's debrief what happened, that person's like, oh, look, I'm really sorry. I I feel like Jen, I feel like I said something that shut you down. That was not my intention. Mm. It's simply naming the dynamic. So that's really the rule. And then it gets into trouble if you name the dynamic while you're heated. As the leader, that makes it worse. (laughs) So better quiet and revisit it when you're a little more rational. Let's say we're in that group situation. You're running the meeting. I'm the anxious person. Every time you have an idea, it's like, Steve, I don't know that's going to work. Or, oh, last time we tried that, it just, it just like, I don't know, man, I'm totally overwhelmed. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. And I'm, I'm taking the whole, I'm not just expressing my thoughts, but I'm taking the whole group. I'm basically shutting it down. Yeah. What do you say to me in that moment if you're level-headed? Yeah, so you're now the yeah, but guy, right? Yeah, I'm the yeah, like, but. I'm the yeah, but. The yeah I'm but. The, um, I am so overwhelmed right now and slammed. I don't. I can't even think about this. Don't you think we have enough to do? Um, yeah. I got a million reasons why your idea is a bad idea. Yeah, you're the but what, what about guy. So I would typically let it go a couple of meetings. I'd watch it. So what I'm training leaders to do is pay attention to recurring predictable patterns in any group that you lead. Mm. And you can practice this with your family. It's fun to watch your kids. But the way you know a group is catching everyone's anxiety is when the same people are like taking on the same characters. So in any staff meeting, it's always the same person as the last word. It's always the same person that no matter what people shared, he or she get to like override the decision. Mm. right? Um, It's always the same people that never speak up in the meeting, then they have their own meeting after the meeting. So I'm training leaders to pay attention to that first. Okay, hey, run a few meetings. And as you're doing the agenda, have one eye on the agenda and have one eye on recurring predictable patterns. Now, as I just said that right now, Kerry, most of your listeners, they can already map it out. Like Mm. you probably can too. Um, And so once you've figured out the recurring predictable pattern, it kind of spoils you because now you can't not see it. Right. Now you have this power tool. My next move is to bring that person into a one-on-one. 
and say, I've noticed this recurring predictable pattern. Uh, now, the ideal way to do it is to not accuse, but to confess. So I've often, especially when I was a young leader and I was still growing in my leadership, what would happen is I'd notice these patterns, but sometimes I'd let someone get away with it for so long. I felt like unethical to change it on them. Mm. So when I meet with them, I would, I would confess. I'd say, look, there's two problems. The first problem is the way you're showing up. The second problem is I'm letting you get away with it. Mm. And the reason I've been letting you get away with it is I didn't know what to do. I really like you. I don't want to shame you in a meeting. I don't want to call you out. So what, what's been happening is I go home and I stew. I have an anger fantasy about you. I'm frustrated. Then I work myself down and I'm fine. Then you do it again and I do it again. So, hey, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm telling you my part of the problem. Now, can we talk about your part of the problem? What do you and I need to do so that you're not the yeah but guy? Because everybody in that room knows you're the yeah but guy. Wow. Now, what might happen if you can do this from a humble posture, and I genuinely mean like you're actually coming alongside, you're not like this top down, hey, you're going to knock it off. They may, they may actually help you. They may say, listen, you don't, here's what you don't know. You don't know that you wear all of us out with all your ideas that never go anywhere. Mm. Like you're the, I might be the air butt guy. You're the idea guy that you don't care about. So like I, I have a friend in my life and, and his, his wife says he has ideas that he won't care about tomorrow. That's how she describes him. And she's learned that the way I love him is I sit through his ideas knowing that tomorrow he won't care about him. Now, you might be that kind of leader and the yeah, but guy is feeling a, a balance, like a, a seesaw, a teeter-totter. And that's where anxiety management really gets powerful is when you stop seeing the problem inside someone and you start seeing it between you and that person. What is the recurring dynamic between you and me? Mm. So on the one hand, the yeah, but guy might need to change. On the other hand, he might be saying, the more ideas you generate that we don't do, the more I feel my job is to bring you down to earth. Well, now you have an ally. Now you have somebody where the two of you, can we agree together that, that we're going to both be different, right? So I've been the idea guy. I've been the guy in meetings where people are like, Steve, you have a hundred ideas, 70 of them are bad. Um, and then 10 of them are amazing. And we just have to sit through, you know, the many to get to the few. And so I've now often said that to people. Hey, the only way I know how to get to a good idea is to get through a whole bunch of bad ideas. I'll try to help you know when we're going to take traction or not. So I don't know if that And that helps, manages that's- leadership anxiety when you're, it's kind of like related to self-awareness and being able to process it. Yeah, you do, yeah. all you're doing is naming what people feel. People... Pay attention to content, what's being said, but they react emotionally to process, the mm-hmm. way we relate. So if you're naming process, you're, you're giving people an incredible tool. Yeah. yeah. And so let's go back to, because a lot of the people who listen to the show are decision makers. Um, so they are in that seat, whether it's with their team or in the senior seat in the organization, but they're definitely, you know, that person in the room who it's always hard to speak the truth to power, right? Really hard to have that conversation. Um, any other tips for becoming aware that you're anxious and you're bringing that anxiety into a meeting or into a dynamic, you know, just your, your team dynamics, your, you, you could be in your preaching. It could be in your vision casting. It could be in your, uh, day to day, your one-on-ones. Like, how do you know that you might be exuding anxiety? Yeah. There's three, there's three simple ways to know you're anxious. The first one's in your body. Uh, you can start noticing when your mind spins, when your heart's racing or when your body's tightening and tightening is either like clenched shoulders, muscular or like stomach and nauseous. So I I would say for every listener right now, simply you can name out loud or if maybe you're driving in a car and you can just say, the way I know I'm anxious is my mind spins. Mm. The way I know I'm anxious is my heart races. That's a simple way. Uh, Some people will be listening. They'd be like, well, it's all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a few people will be like, well, it's none of them. So if, if, if your listeners are saying, well, it's none of those, then ask someone who loves you and they'll tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, but your body, your body can tell you when you're anxious. Uh, for me, it's a spinning mind. I try to worry my way to peace and it never works. No, it never works. Never, it's never worked. And it's like drinking salt water, but I believe that it works. And so if 
what happens is anxiety grabs you and then it kind of drags you along like a moth to a flame. So once you know in your body, you can actually intervene earlier. So that's the first. Hmm. The second one is to simply name something that you need that you don't really need. Affirmation, control, having hmm. the last word, doing it perfectly. Just naming that gives you, it's like confession, it gives you power over it. Hmm. So the next time I go into a meeting, I know that I need to be respected. So when I feel disrespected, I get anxious. Uh, that's step two. Step three, wow. this is my favorite, is um, anxiety, chronic anxiety and knowing God's with you, they don't coexist. So mm. the surefire way that you know you're anxious is you've forgotten that God is with you. And what that looks like is a feeling of it's all on my shoulders. You know, before we hit the microphone, Gary, I was telling you that I've been really anxious the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so I'm not like the anxiety guru, that like Yoda, like I'm above yeah. everybody else. I get anxious every day. But I, I was probably in a two to three week spiral because I've, I'm in a project right now with unending work. There's just mm. no end to it. Mm. And I'm putting myself under all this pressure. And the way I know I'm anxious is I forget that I'm actually in God's hands. And so what I do is I've learned to notice when I've forgotten that God's with me. So I know that's kind of nuanced. Like God's always with us. It's not that God leaves. It's that we no longer notice because the, the space where we notice God, that's the space that chronic anxiety fills. You know, so, so John says, perfect love casts out fear. So I, I just want your listeners just to picture like perfect love displaces anxiety. It's, it's amazing. You cannot be anxious and loved at the same time. So if you are experiencing love, and by the way, you also can't be laughing and anxious. Laughter also displaces anxiety. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it does, right? It's just like- Yeah, it totally does. Yeah. And that's another tool leaders can use. If you step on a landmine in a meeting, you say something stupid, you can just make a joke about yourself and everyone feels better and you feel better. That's because laughter dissipates anxiety. So, you know, when I was a chaplain, this is when I really first learned this. Like I would- I'd do these marathon 28-hour overnight shifts. Maybe one day uh, I've helped four people die. Mm. And I'm in the break room. It's 1 a.m. I'm watching Seinfeld because I need to numb out. I'm eating my little chuck wagon steak. And the beeper goes off and it's death number five. And I just feel like I can't do it anymore. Like, uh. And then what happens, because I'm not getting what I think I need, which is Seinfeld and Chuck Wagon steak, that's being taken from me. So now I'm angry. That's how I know I'm anxious, because I'm angry. Oh. And I'm angry at the person for dying and inconveniencing my Seinfeld episode. Now, if I'm not aware of that, Kerry, what will happen is I'll walk into that room and I'll manipulate the widower. I'll, I'll, I'm saying to myself, I can listen to him for eight minutes as he grieves. And because I'm a person of power as a chaplain, I can say, hey, let me just share Philippians. And can I pray for you? Oh yeah, Which that's is, always the closer, right? Can I pray for right? you? That's how you it's, get out of meetings. Yeah. It's code for I've had enough. <laughs> I'm not actually praying for him. I'm trying to get back to Seinfeld. Now that's really dark, but every one of us do it or have done it. However, I get the beep death number five, I'm angry. Yeah. If I'm able to say, okay, here's what's going on is I'm in the grip of anxiety right now. Uh, and I just pause for a minute. Okay, God, you actually, what's true is you're with me and, and you can carry me. But then where I really relax carry is, and, and this is what I do all the time now is I remember God's not only with me, God is already at work in the room that I'm about to enter. So I'm about to enter an anxious elder meeting. In fact, I've got one tonight. Mm. And as I walk into that elder meeting, I'm saying, God, you are already in that room at work. It's not all on me. I don't have to have the answer. All I have to do is walk in and enjoy your presence as we have this difficult or wonderful meeting. Um, and recently, here's where I've learned this, Kerry, is with church planters in Denver of all places. Mm. Um, we're one of the most unchurched counties in America. So we attract church planners like blood to sharks, right? And, and I am a leader of a former young church plant and all these church plants come and go. Once in a while, I'll get a mailer in my mailbox 
And I'm sorry to, since we've been doing generalizations today, it's often from Texas. Right. And it's a Texas pastor coming to the front range of Colorado and the mailer in the mailbox says, coming soon, a church. And then it's some, the tagline is bringing God to the front range of Colorado. That's what they say. We're bringing God to the front range. And I look at that and I think to myself, you jerk. Like, <laughs> first of all, Philip Yancey moved to Colorado in like the 1990s. Can't we agree that God's been in Colorado at least as long as Philip Yancey? At least Yancey? since Can't, the early 90s. Yep. At least since the early 90s. But what they believe is that they are bringing God with them. But there's way better news that really relaxes us is God's already at work. So whatever meeting your listeners are anxious about, just the recognition God's with me, but God's also ahead of me. That's probably been my most powerful tool. It is amazing how you forget. I mean, I'm pretty anchored in my quiet time, but I was, I was telling you about an interview I had done earlier today that really moved me. And like, I literally dropped to my knees. And part of that was I forgot God had more invested in it than I did. It was a good drop oh, to my wow. knees, That's but good. I just forgot. It's like, oh yeah, you knew this. Like, I didn't know it, but you knew it. And oh, I like that. What a, what a calm that is, right? When, when you can figure that out. So the last year has been crazy and you've been dealing with a growing church and also the whole managing leadership anxiety thing that you do has just really taken off. Yeah. Um, and so you're dealing with rapid growth, uncertainty, global pandemic, you know, all the crises that we've been navigating. What have been some good practices for you over the last year to manage your anxiety in the midst of all of this? Yeah. Oh, great question. So, you know, last time I was on the show, I don't expect people to remember, but we did talk about this thing called a life-giving list. It's the- Oh, I simplest. downloaded it, man, and shared it with yeah. friends. Like, yeah, yeah. It's the simplest idea. And it's for those who haven't heard of it, it's just the list of the people and the places and the activities in your life that connect you to God or make you feel alive. And you just shared a really beautiful one, just taking those few moments between interviews to, to have an encounter with God. Because- you know, on my own podcast, I ask every guest, and when you came on, you were gracious enough to answer the question, when in your life do you feel most fully loved? And I, I love when people answer it. I got fascinated by, can I come up with 90 answers? Like, so right now my life giving list has 88 items on it. Oh, man. Um, I actually run an online community called Capable Life, and I'm about to launch a channel where everybody shares five things off their life-giving list. Because what I've learned is we all kind of adopt each other's. I was coaching a group of pastors and we we're doing life-giving list. And I said, okay, everyone go around, tell us one life-giving thing that you added to your list this week. And one of the pastors, he said, the most remarkable thing, he said, this is the first week that I've noticed that the first time I see my kids every morning is a gift from God. Mm. And as soon as I heard it, I'm like, well, now I'm adding that to my list. Mm -hmm. And so this morning... My, I've got two teenagers in the house, one at college. I see both of my teenagers and it's not just another morning when I see my teens. Now it's like, God, thank you that you gave me these incredible kids that I enjoy. And the first moment of every day is now a gift from God. Um, I was awake at 4 a.m. this morning. I, I slept too well and woke up wide awake. Yeah. And not to be too graphic, Kerry, but I just reached over to my wife's leg mm. and just spent time saying, God, the physical touch of my wife. And this poor woman's asleep. Um, <laughs> but this may sound crazy to some people, but touching my wife on the leg is on my life-giving list and it's a different item than going out on a date. So I'm very specific and as you might imagine, quite graphic yeah. on my life-giving list. Um, so I, I definitely dug deeper into that this year. I made the decision as an Enneagram 3 to n be less efficient and less productive because I knew that that I was going to be. Um, I've now become a stay-at-home dad. My wife, uh, her business has picked up and she's out of the house a lot. And um, my daughter um, has picked up, we think, a stalker in the neighborhood. Oh boy. And so I'm home a lot just for her to be safe. Um, and, I, yeah. yep, and I don't think it'll be long-term. Uh, we're, we're working through it. But a home is not a good place for me to write a sermon. Mm. Um, and I'm less efficient at home but I'm more forgiving of myself. So, so those life-giving activities have been huge. And then the other thing I have really found helpful is to stop pretending I know what to do in unprecedented leadership decisions. 
And so every step of the way with our church, when we send a video update, you know, when we're navigating everything, we just tell our church, listen, this might be the wrong call. We've, we've put a lot of thought, a lot of research. We've listened to a lot of leaders. Here's the call we're making. And we just want you to know we might change our mind. Uh, things might shift and you might feel a little jerked around. And you might even say, ah, oh, I told you so. And you might be right. But rather than trying to present a bold front that we actually know what we're doing, because I just found so many leaders believe the lie that they should know how to lead through ambiguity when they've never had to do it before. Mm. Um, mm. That'd be a couple of things. Those are really good. I'll, I'll add one little hack to the um, life-giving list. We were talking Please. about it before we started recording, but you know, my wife and I being in and out of lockdown, mostly in over the last year, uh, just with our place north of Toronto, is like, we haven't seen people in five weeks. So we started creating fake date nights. We always have one Friday, but Wednesday is fake night date night. And we call it that because it's not the real date night, date night, but you know, we light the candles, make a special meal, kind of hang out. And it's kind of a nice little break in the clouds in the middle of the week. Yeah. Uh, almost every leader I've talked to from the people who lead the largest churches, largest companies to, yeah, it's without exception, the, the, you know, tiniest startups are like, I've never worked harder in my life. Yeah. I've, I've heard that over and over again over the last year. One of the challenges, Steve, is a lot of us are working from home. We're all doing the work that's never done. Your sermon's never finished. The company's never performed well enough. Your team is never fully developed. Um, any thoughts on the boundaries? Because it seems like, you know, when there was an office to go to, yeah. <laughs> it's easier. It's like, okay, I'm closing the door, six o'clock, five o'clock, four o'clock, pick your time. I'm out of here. Now I'm home with the kids. But we have these devices, which you've had for years, that follow us everywhere. And I've worked from home for a long time, had to create boundaries. A lot of leaders are struggling with that for the first time because school's home, you know, work is home, home is home, food is home, and your devices are always on. Any any thoughts on boundaries and healthy practices for a time where it feels like Groundhog Day, where every day is the I same? Know. Man, Kerry, I really think we should turn the mics around on this one. I think you're further ahead than me. Well, I don't know. Because because COVID for my particular field, it did blow my world up. So I'm a full-time lead pastor of a church I love. I've been here 16 years mm -hmm. and poured my heart and soul into this church and also released a book a year before COVID that COVID escalated. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I am failing at boundaries as I try to lead a church into unknown. You know, we, we were not really a live streaming church before and now we are. And we are now live streaming into all 50 states and we are having these exciting conversations about what does it look like to things that you've been doing for years, Carrie, you know, mm -hmm. we're slow to adopt at the same time. I'm trying to build and honor leaders who are wanting me to come in and help their organization or, um, so I, I feel I like it. I'm, I'm not a good example. Hard, it's hard. Yeah. But I think you've probably been further down the road. It might be helpful to hear a couple of things you've found helpful. One is a definite end of the workday. My wife and I, because she now does what I do. She left law three years ago, released her own book. It's doing really, really well. And she yeah, has lots of opportunities. Book, right? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah. But we're like, when are we done today? And we put a time on the calendar and we're finished. Are you working after dinner or not? And then sometimes one of us will work and the other won't. But like, you know, there's no end to it. Um, Honestly, and I'm not doing great at it either, but like I've got a section of my new book, which comes out in September on mastering the art of saying no. But I feel like that is a daily discipline, the inbound, the number of requests, the number of opportunities. And I realize they're sacred trusts. They're not going to be here forever. It's just really hard because there's so many great opportunities. So literally today, my team and I are working on what we call new filters. So we're going to reboot the website so that when you fill out the form, to request me to do something. It's clearer in the future, but like, we haven't got this nailed. Like I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. Another thing I've been practicing probably more in the last year than at any time in my life is a Sabbath. Mm. And after a year of trying and mostly failing, I think I've had a couple under my belt now where I'm like, that was actually really enjoyable. Like giving myself permission to not be productive. Super hard for me. I'm so driven, but just to, I've had a couple of moments where my wife and I are sitting around. It's just the two of us. We're empty nesters. And like, I'm just reading a book for reading a book. It's not podcast prep. It's not like anything like that. And I'm like, we got our feet up 
And I'm like, I have seen pictures of this in a magazine, but this has never been my life. Mm. And I know my kids crave that because they grew up around a, a workaholic dad. And I'm like, okay, well, just because the last 20 years were like incessant me doesn't mean yeah. the next does. And then, and then filling, filling the space with good things, I would say. That life-giving list um, has been really helpful. So we reserved for the very first time, we're boaters. We always trailer it. It's cheaper, all that yeah. stuff. But like yeah. everybody bought a boat. So now it's super busy in the parking lot. So we got a slip this year. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's like, it's going to be easier to use the boat. It's just there. Cost of entry is a lot lower in terms of time investment. And just like, yeah, drive on over to the marina, um, pop off the tarp on the boat and head out. Right. And you don't have to worry yeah. about, can we get a parking spot at the ramp? And then we got to put it back. We got to be back at a certain time. It's like, so we think we'll use that a lot more because I find if I just sit around, I just think about work all the time and I'm like, oh, I could write this or I could do this or I could, oh, that talk isn't quite finished. And, and so when I'm on the water, uh, that's all I think about. You know what I like about that answer is I was listening to it carefully there, Kerry, is, is what you taught us is how you lower the threshold to make it easier to trip into life-giving habits. Like the boat, you wouldn't go boating as much because of the hassle. So you remove the hassle, which I'm sure costs some money, but now you've, you just, it's a quicker access to life-giving. <laughs> it's cheaper you know, than you think. And my son oh, said sure. to me, my youngest son said to me, I told you to do this years ago. I'm like, yeah, you always oh. do. You're always way ahead of me. But, you know, part of that was like, do I want to fight for a parking space? Do I want to? And then we have an east wind, which is rare around here. But when it happens, it can be super challenging to put the boat back on the trailer because it's like I got one shot at this and I either hit the rocks and wreck the boat or I hit the trailer. I've always hit the trailer, but like, you know, the wind can whip up pretty quickly. Well, that's not going to happen at the marina. So, um, yeah, you know, and, and there's peace of mind with that. And we'll see if we like it. Maybe we won't do it again. But it was it was an opportunity to reduce the cost of entry mentally, emotionally, because so many times we're like, oh, the lake looks great. And I'm like, do you really want to trailer up the boat? Do you really want to go down to the, do you want to, what if we don't get a parking spot? What if there's a line when we go to retrieve it now? It's like, well, that's our slip. So it's just going to sit there. It's a modest slip, but it's fine. Yeah, it's like the people who pack all their camping gear in tubs and just throw them in instead of pack to camp. They just throw in the stuff and go camping. Oh, you're right. Yeah, because if you yeah. got to organize all that stuff. Yeah, you right? got to go. Or a yeah, favorite the, chair on the deck. It's like buy yourself a $100 chair on the deck and go sit in that because it's comfortable. And then you can just sit there and enjoy it. Yeah, it's good. I don't know. One of the, one of the deeper tools I have cultivated this year is I, I'm helping leaders name and notice their inner critic. Cause I think what's mm. going on with COVID is we all think we should be doing better than we're doing. And, and then our inner critic kicks in and basically puts us into, you know, shame and condemnation. Yeah. Um, so I've had this exercise with people where I have them get into groups and name for each other, what the message their inner critic says. And then the group's job is to listen to the adjectives and the adjectives always come back the same as like condemning, unrelenting, harsh, unforgiving. Yeah. And then it's a simple prayer. It's, it's like, what if I was at least as blank to myself as God is? Right. So that's, that's been a simple tool I've used this year for myself. Like, what if I was at least as patient with myself as God is? Because I tend to be pretty harsh about my own leadership capacity. Mm. And I'm pretty forgiving of myself, except when it comes to leadership mistakes. And then I beat mm. myself up. And what I've noticed is, man, I'm giving more weight to my inner critic than to the God of the universe. You know, I'm, I'm elevating one over the other. So... Well, That's let's unpack that because there was an inner critic behind not mooring my boat for a long time. It feels like something rich people do. You know, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, is it a waste of money? Number three, mm, I don't really know. Can you be out on the water too much? Lots of other people don't have boats, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and for years we had a 25 year old boat that barely ran. So, I mean, I'll put myself in that category for a while too. Now we have a, a more recent model uh, that does run. But, you know, there's, there's so much guilt associated with that. And I think church life accelerates that. Yeah. Any I, thought I, on that? I made a statement, but it was supposed to be a question. No, I think you're right. And, and as I heard your list, because I grew up in a boating family. My grandfather used to build his own boat. He'd live on it. It was the 30-foot foot, 34-foot boat. We'd all oh, go you could live on, on a 34-foot boat. Yeah. Oh, luck, it was incredible. But I, as I heard your list, I, I would simply say it is something that rich people have. And what an incredible gift from God. 
You know, like mm. the, the stigma of wealth is what I heard as the yeah. source of anxiety. Um, and I know in my own life, I was raised low income and, and then kind of medium. And now my parents would be like high income. Um, I have a poverty mindset and it uh. helped me to realize that, um, that I don't know what to do with money and resource, you know? So that, I guess that's where I would go next. No, like, that's a, that, that is a big issue because the stereotype, I think for a lot of people in ministry is, you know, pastors are overpaid, et cetera. And, and I would say, I don't, I don't think that was ever an issue in, in our church, but, um, or your most pastors are grossly underpaid. And yeah, then they feel, exactly. then they feel very guilty if, you know, they end up with a nice house or they drive a car that actually is shiny or, you know, whatever, whatever, or late model or that kind of thing. And so, yeah, you're navigating and all of that creates an anxiety in leadership that is more complicated. Yeah. Any thoughts yeah, on navigating it, that? Oh, I just am a big believer in name it to tame it. I think mm. once you know that there was some kind of stigma about a slip and a boat and wealth, now you have to do something about like is like mm. to me the beauty of the reason I do all my work on chronic anxiety is it absolutely competes with the gospel at every aspect of our life. So what's the good news? Is the good news <laughs> that right like your belief your about wealth critic never has good news. I'll tell you that. Never. Steve. That's never. how so so getting back to this simple idea of the way you know you're anxious is you forget God's with you. The way you you know that is is the doom and the bad news. So chronic anxiety actually has a gospel, hmm. and it's it has a message, just like Jesus, just like the Roman Empire had, just like America has a message. Chronic anxiety has a message. It's all on you. There's probably nothing you can do. You should have done it better. You should have known better. You should be further along. All these shoulds and oughts. We we as we famously say, we should all over ourselves. <laughs> And, and so just this simple idea of, well, what's the good news of Jesus? Like if it's really true that Jesus sets us free, then I personally think that chronic anxiety becomes the number one way we can actually be transformed by Christ. Because to me, in the 21st century, it is the chief competitor for the heart, more mm. than money. Like I yeah. know in the scripture, I know the scripture said, but actually if you get past the whole God and mammon thing, which I agree, what Jesus and Paul spent most of their time talking about was the self, or it's, it's also the flesh in the right. Bible, uh, or the, the man in the you know in the charismatic tradition is the wonderful phrase the old man you know the anthropos in the Greek, and Jesus and Paul both and Peter they're all every time they talk about it they have these stark warnings, crucify it, be wary of it, be so, don't give yourself to it like they're really quite alarmist like Jesus says. Anyone who denies self takes up your cross daily. So I, all the argument I'm making is that self is evidenced by chronic anxiety. And therefore, that's our opportunity to actually have an encounter with Jesus. I, I think the number one challenge of faith leaders is we proclaim it more than we experience it. We proclaim the grace of God and there's a big gap between experiencing it for ourselves. And I, I personally think here it's related to this poverty mindset where we don't believe we deserve the grace. And, and what you and I aren't talking about prosperity and money. We're no, just no, talking no. about the goodness of God. You know, it's so funny because as you're sharing that, you know, kill the, the flesh, I always, there, there's a subtext in some strands of thinking in the church that would say, no, what you're killing is the fun. Like, don't have any fun anymore. Don't enjoy your life. Don't, don't actually enjoy the goodness of God. Any truth to that? You ever heard that? Like, I love that you asked that because in anxiety, the, the, the clinical term for this anxiety is family systems theory. This is what I was trained in. Ah, okay. Or Bowen theory for people who like Google. So um, they actually train you to go into an organization and measure the level of playfulness. And mm. that helps you know how much anxiety they have. And the higher the level of playfulness, and also the higher the threshold for offense. In other words, how, how playful and how much do these people laugh and enjoy each other? The more playful, the less anxious they are. And how hard are they to offend? The harder they are to offend, the less anxious they are. Oh so my therefore, goodness. isn't that something? Of, whoa. So earnestness becomes an actual measurable trait of anxiety in a group. 
These people are all earnest. They're tiptoeing around each other. Don't say the wrong thing. This person can't take that. That's how you know they're in anxiety's grip. Also known as Facebook. Also known as Facebook. (laughs) Also known as people who are very devout, very serious about their faith, very devoted, very earnest, very... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Very serious, like very Just serious earnest. about their theology, Just very earnest. serious about work, very serious about the mission. Yeah, oh, so man. let's name names, right? Like let's talk about a devout person that you and I both, I mean, I'm sure you know Bob, I don't know him, but Bob Goff. Yeah. Now there is a guy that anyone who wants to make a case that he's not devout with the work he's doing in the globe, in the world. Oh my goodness. Uh, talk about someone like Christine Kane. Uh, anyone want to make a case that she's not devout? You talk about people who are quick to laugh, have a blast, doing some of the most challenging, gut-wrenching work in the world and some of the most playful people you could ever meet. Uh, so yeah, those, those earnest people. And I, I would just say, Kerry, That's so particularly good. for your, lung, your young leaders, just to be so careful not to um, indulge those people. I, those people mm. being the earnest, super spiritual, right? Put you don't on a say that you road. just offended me, right? Those yeah, that yeah. that that mindset. Yeah, those people. I remember. I, I probably shouldn't have done it, but I remember early on. You know, one of the guests at our church, she laid out every pastor who had ever let her down before she came to our church, and I was a bit less. I had less of a filter and wisdom back then. I was more obnoxious, and I just said, "Why don't you behead me now and mount my head on your wall? Let's get it over with." Because, right, my job as an anxiety coach is to notice recurring predictable patterns. Of course, I'm going to be past the number seven. But I, I didn't say it in a way that was helpful because it, I, I, I meant to say it playfully. And to what I was trying to say is, can we get the offense out of the way and let's see what's on the other side of this? Like, where, that's where the good stuff is, is on the other side of the offense. But, of course, she I can't stop offended. laughing. That's really funny. Why don't you yeah. just behead me now? Because that's what she she had mounted these pastors' heads on a wall like a deer. I'm next, and sure enough, she did to me too. And she, you know, told everyone she'd ever met, as the Bible says, about all the terrible things I'd done to her. Um, and that's well, anxiety spreading in a group. Let's play the other side, just to to play devil's advocate for a moment. So I'm resonating with what you're saying, but the other side is okay. So we become this self affirming. You only live once. Best version of yourself self-actualized, there is no such thing as sin or wrong. I'm just out for me and my pleasure. Where, where, like, you're not going there, but I can see some people going, so what is that? Is this what we're embracing? Like, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. so you're, you're, de- you're actually describing hedonism, which I'm not a fan of ah, myself. Okay. I personally yes. don't subscribe to hedonism. Um, but I have had people critical when I talk about this. They, they'll say, you know, when I say, look, our job isn't to be like Christ. Our job is just to die to self. Like if you look in the scripture, mm-hmm. Jesus didn't tell us to be like him. He just tells us to die to ourself. And people say, oh, well, you're just kind of talking about like laziness. Just sit around in life's hot tub. God does it all. I'm like, no, no. Have you tried dying to yourself lately? Like it's hard work. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm advocating that. That, and what anxiety does is it gets between us and it infects our ability to have a human-to-human connection. Mm. So as a leader, so many people either lionize me to be bigger than I am or they demonize me to be a monster that I'm not. Mm. They, they make me bigger or they shrink me down. The people who make me bigger, so, so in my case, I've done seven years of full-time theological education. I did a Bible degree in college, and then I mm. went and did a Bible degree in graduate school. I'm just mm. Bibled up. And, but, but because I have a gift of communication and a lot of experience, and I'm paid for about 20 hours a week to, to, to prepare, and because I did seven years of full-time scripture study, I'm able to make meaning out of the Bible for people and help them connect with God. It's mm. one of the things I can do. But people ascribe to me that I'm closer to Jesus than I really am, or that I really might be. Like I may not be any closer to God than the than the man that changes the diapers in the nursery, mm-hmm. but because I move people, they say I'm. So then they put me on the so-called pedestal. So they lionize you. Yeah, lionize me. The other people, because of their baggage, like we, I have so many people in the church right now. You know, the last church really hurt me. Um, I was just seeing on Instagram Steve Carter. I'm sure you know yeah, Steve, know Steve, who Steve, was yeah. what a what a great human being. Yeah. He posted this amazing thing on Instagram. Somehow he got caught up. I don't know if he started the thread or he jumped in on it, but people were talking about the church always, the church hurt me, the church hurt me. 
And Steve Carter, formerly of Willow Creek, hmm. posts on Instagram. He says, you know, I used to say the church hurt me, but as I think about it, five people hurt me. But I call it the church. I thought that was amazing hmm. of him just saying, you know what's brought me healing, he's saying, is, is noticing it's not the church, it's five people in a big church. Um, so a lot of people come to my church and they say, the church hurt me, the church hurt me, the last pastor did blank. And they, they do what I've diagnosed as same species syndrome. Because I'm the same species as the former pastor, I'm already under suspicion. Mm. And they can't see me as a human being. They're seeing me through the lens of their pain. And so in my anxiety coaching, what I'm trying to help leaders do is to learn to have an exactly human-sized encounter with other people. So the lady, you know, who I foolishly said to put my head on a wall, what I was trying to say was, can we be humans with each other? Can we stop this cycle of pastors letting you down? Let me just let you down and let's be humans and see what happens. And So as, 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 well. as, as funny as that was, and, and thank you for that, um, how would you approach it now if she comes in and says, well, my last pastor, she names all six, all seven, and you know, you're number seven or whatever, and you're having that conversation, what would the slightly more mature, wiser, older Steve say to her these days? How would you diffuse that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I would actually use the same words, interestingly enough, but I think I've matured in my posture. And I think that was the mistake is it sounded smarmy. It mm. sounded like I was above her. I think I now know how to say, can I, can I share a pattern that I'm hearing that I'm, con I'm afraid that you'll never get to know me. You'll only put my head on a wall like you did these other pastors. Like, these pastors that let you down, it might be that some of them really were abusive, but it's also probably true that some of them were exactly human-sized and you had expectations of them that no one could measure up. I won't be able to measure up. I want you to know right now when I hear that, it makes me anxious mm. to hear that. And I just want to name that to you because I'm going to let you down. How about this? How about I let you down right now? And can we get it over with? I, it'd, be, it'd be quite similar. Yeah, but, but I, my, see what you, I see what you mean. That is, that is a very different gentler. conversation. And, yeah, it's, it's and less very attacking. very refreshing. Yeah. The, the goal of anxiety management is never to put someone on the back foot. It's always to invite connection. Mm. You know, so, so some of the people I train these tools in, they do unfortunately wield them. It's always to move toward each other. Uh, so that's the, I think that's where I've probably matured is. You know, so many that. people come to mind as you're describing that uh, scenario of what I call roast pastor, because you realize you're just the next victim, right? And what, uh, what understanding that, I used to take that very personally, very seriously. It used to be very wounding, but being able to spot the patterns actually does two things for me. It makes me understand. I'm like, oh, I think I see where this is going okay, beware, beware. This could be a rabbit trail. This could be, you know, this could take down the organization. Like we have to be careful, but it also gives me empathy. Like there's, yeah. there's something in her heart, his heart, that, that is hurting, that makes him want to hurt other people. Uh, I may not be the person to solve that, but uh, what, are, what are some other benefits of being able to spot the patterns in terms of managing your own anxiety? I think that, I think you named the number one benefit, which is empathy rather than self-righteousness. Because mm. if I'm not moving toward empathy, like you just said, I get self-righteous in my head and I, I then demonize that person. In my immature days, I would gang up on them. I'd actually, use, mm. I'm not proud of this, but I'd use my power as a pastor. Hey, can't we all agree this person's crazy? That kind of thing. Now what it looks like is an anger fantasy. The reason, I, the way I know I'm self-righteous is when I'm having an anger fantasy about someone that's wounded me. Mm. So this empathy move you're describing, that has really set me free. That same move you made. I would simply say the extra move I make in my coaching with people is helping you figure out how do I, because the, the general rule of anxiety is you try to put it back where it belongs. Whoever's generating the anxiety, you try to make them carry the weight of it. So if this person is demonizing you, same species syndrome, all pastors can't be trusted, I'm trying to figure out a way for her or him to carry the weight of that rather than me spinning on it. Mm. And I usually feed it back to them now in a way to give them an opportunity to change. Okay. And to say, hey, I want, can I share with you what I'm noticing, what I'm hearing? And I'm usually confessing, I want you to know I'm afraid right now. I'm afraid that I can't help you see who I really am because all you can see is another pastor is going to let me down. 
So I just want to name that. What What's it like for you to hear that from me? Does that... And so now there's actual gospel opportunity. Uh, and I've had great success um, with a lot of people to actually move toward each other. And then I've probably still got in... You know, most churches have five or six bullies. I've probably got about that in my church that mm. after doing that once, I'm now measuring... Are they wielding my words against me? Are they wielding my vulnerability against me? In which case I categorize them as a usual suspect bully. Or are they moving toward the light? Like Henry Cloud teaches us, you yeah. know, you give people, if they're moving toward it, now there's actually, I no longer am categorizing them. They're a real human being. And then the bullies, I've got, I want to say I've got about six that have been with me most of the time I've been at my church. I always bring an elder. I no longer share vulnerability with them. I, I mostly listen. And what I've done with a couple of them is say to them, uh, what is the goal of this meeting? It feels to me like the goal is Steve loses. Now, maybe that's not the goal. And again, I'm not being smarmy. I'm not being top down. I'm just saying, this is what it feels like to be me right now. I think the goal is step on my neck. If that's the goal, let's just get it over with. Like if the goal is defeat, then Come on, let's How go. How do they respond to that? Well, so again, some it stops some people in their tracks. And then most of those people, to be frank, Kerry, they, they, they do better for a few weeks and then they regress. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at least it stops me. It puts the anxiety back where it belongs on the one generating. That's the win for me is I get to go home and say, well, I said my piece and I was heartfelt and now they have to live with themselves. One of the things you've, we've talked on about a couple times in this conversation is uh, the criticism. So I'm thinking about my public inbox, social media, same for a lot of pastors, where um, you get highly offendable people. Uh, I'm thinking about one email I got about a guest I had on my podcast, and this person didn't like where this person stood on a particular hot button issue. So how dare I have this person on my podcast? And we, we get that stuff on social media. We get that stuff in inboxes. Pastors get that, that you should have signed the petition. Why aren't you standing up to the governor? What do you mean about masks? What about vaccines, right? And it's clear that I'm not having a dialogue with you. It is clear. Like, I'm thinking about this email I got yesterday, and I read my team sent it to me. Like, how do we respond? And I'm like, this is this triggered something very deep in her, something that she was very angry about, yeah. that, that had really nothing to do with the conversation, just that I know where this person stands on X, you talk to this person, therefore you have made a mistake. Yes. And I I'm, I don't, I didn't know how to respond to that yeah, because it was an email, not a social media comment. So I kind of said no response or thank you. Your views are noted, Carrie, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. It's very neutral because I realized if you go down that rabbit hole, like I'm going to be there for a year. Nobody's different. She's, she's not changing or he's not changing in that case. And pastors have probably, and leaders have had more of that than anything over the last year, whether the stance they took or didn't take on the election, whether it was the mask, anti-mask thing, vaccine, no vaccine, opening, reopening, they're getting positions thrown at them. Any thought, and that generates anxiety in me, still does. I still feel that yeah. stuff. Uh, what, what do you do with those, what I'm going to call boilerplate? It's not like, hey, Steve, when you shared this one point in your message on Tuesday, I'm not a frequent flyer. I'm talking about people who are just Fire, firing off missiles on their pet project or pet issue or pet doctrine, and you just happen to be the latest recipient. Yep. Yeah. So, so in your unique world of being a quite a public figure that gets a lot of online communication, I'm not sure if this applies. Like I, I was hearing that exchange with the email and this lady, and thinking, you know, your response just kind of closes the door, and that's probably wisdom. Is just mm. to say, basically, you're sending the message: we're not going to play. I yeah, I was trying complete... to send that message because yeah. I have tried to play and occasionally I still try to play and it just, it never goes well. Yeah, I think that's right because I think that's the nature of email and social media. I think mm. in a church context or business leaders with an organization or customers, it's an ongoing relationship. And I, I think the beauty is if you can lead with vulnerability, if your goal is two things, one is to name the dynamic so what you did for me here is you actually didn't give me any content. You didn't say, here's what the email is about. Here was the issue. You actually beautifully named the dynamic for me. I did this. I had this guy on. She didn't like it. She had this. That's dynamic language. You're, you're mm. plotting out almost like chess moves. He did this. She did this. So I, I think once a leader can name the dynamic, 
then you really can lead with vulnerability and it very quickly shows you who's who. Mm. So the first time you're vulnerable, some people will use your words again. They'll wield them against you and now you know. And it mm. saves you so much time. It saves you so many meetings with what I call, you call them frequent flyers. I love mm. that. I call them usual suspects. Yeah. Every church has usual suspects. I was doing a, a workshop recently and it was over Zoom and I opened up the chat. It was all for pastors. I said, okay, first question, how many people in your church? And it was just a pure numerical. Second question, how many usual suspects or in your language, how many frequent flyers? The biggest number was six. We had people with mm. thousands of people in their church. Six, we all have frequent flyers. So starting with vulnerability um, is a great tool because then you know how they what act What does that afterwards. sound like? So let's say I was going to your church and I'm like, I can't believe that you quoted, well, I've had this. I quoted Jordan Let, Peterson in a message example. a couple of years let's ago that, and someone was grossly lady, offended. Yeah, let's say the email lady was actually a member of your church mm -hmm. um, at, at, at Connexus. Vulnerability looks like, hey, uh, when you sent that email, it obviously triggered something really deep in you because I received it with a lot of heat. Like mm -hmm. it had a lot of heat on it. Now, I know that emails can be tr tricky. Was that your intention to be very angry at me because I hosted somebody who has a view? Is that what you meant? That would be naming the ah. dynamic. And if they're like, yes, Kerry, slippery slope, you know you know what it's like, then I, I, think, I think you'd say, well, we're so far apart, we're never going to agree on that because I'm a curious person. I love learning from all kinds of people, including people I may or may not mm. agree with. And I'll, I'll just let you know, it hurts me to be uh, broad brush. I, no, I don't think you like being broad brush categorized, right, ma'am? I don't either. I don't. It hurts me when someone makes a broad statement about me that's not true. Because mm. actually it's not true that just because I had him on my show means that I'm broadcast, you know. Mm. And then she may or may not well, That's, much, that's a much more nuanced response than I gave. And I'm going to um, read the transcript and go over I, that again. That's really good. I'm not, I'm only putting that context in your church because you'd have an ongoing relationship. I'm not sure. Like, yeah. Like I, when you get, you know, I think our content gets accessed a million and a half, two million times a month. So yeah. it's like, we get a lot of those emails and, and you, you do not have a relationship. I don't have a relationship. I don't, couldn't that even tell me, you who this person's name was right now. The, the email or the message we're not going to play, I think is wise. I'm not mm. saying it's more just in if we put that in a... Yeah, but if it's a relationship, like I can see that if it was a client or it was someone I knew from our church, even though I'm not engaged day to day there, I would I would not treat it the same way. But it's, right. it is a, it is, that, that, that is a very intelligent approach to how to handle that because you're exactly right. Like I fit her template of, yeah. or it could have been him, you know, yep. his template of what a bad person does by hosting people like this. That's right. And it was guilt by association. And so there's just a, a couple of simple tools for people. Um, number one is the, the, the idea that you can only lead people who are moving toward you emotionally. Mm. And every one of us in our organization, we have people who are not moving toward us emotionally. They don't, no matter what you say, they've already decided. And more insight mm. from you does not help. And that's the fallacy that some of your listeners are in is I must give them more insight from me so that they'll move toward me emotionally. So that's why I'm saying, hey, this lady sends you an email. She's not moving toward you and you don't owe her anything. So you, you say, we're not going to play the game. The other thing that I found really helpful is just to simply think about anxiety in four spaces. There's the space mm. inside me. There's the space between me and God. There's the space between me and you. And there's the space inside you. Anxiety is generated when we obsess over the fourth space. So like, Carrie, if you and I were in conflict mm -hmm. and I'm spending all my time saying, what? why is Carrie doing it that way? I, why would he say any kind of why are they doing it this way? That's fourth space. Ah. That's the one space I cannot control. But the other three spaces, I actually can take a lot of responsibility for. Space inside me. Mm. how I react to you. And the whole, this whole conversation got started. We're talking about, you know, politics and all of that. The simple idea that anxiety is contagious between people. So if I see you as the problem, 
if I first look at what am I doing to contribute to the problem. So if I have a critic that's not moving toward me and I'm chasing them, trying to get them to approve of me or understand, I'm part of the problem. Mm. And by simply noticing that and stopping your action, you can actually change your relationship with critics. You can't change the critic. That's fourth space. That's holy ground. I that's, spent a few years trying that. I, I gave me up. Me too. It's like, yeah. So one of the things your listeners can do right now is they can simply say, what is mine to carry? What is God's to carry? What is theirs to carry? And oftentimes we are obsessed with the third, what's theirs to carry. We are trying mm. to manage what's theirs. And so this lady that emailed you, um, she's got a whole lot of work. And what's sad, Carrie, is if she stopped believing the story she's telling herself, which is the sign she's in anxiety's grip, because she's not able to see what's true, which is that you are a curious human that learns from a broad range of people. Uh, I hope also, that's true. Yeah. What's also true, I know that's true. I've been listening to you for years. <laughs> what's also true is it's not true that if I listen to your guest, I'm suddenly infected with his opinions. That's not true. Yeah. I'm, in a, I'm able to manage my own views when I hear someone that I disagree with. But she's so wrapped up in what's not true that I really wish she could get help to stop sending emails because she's not just emailing you, she's emailing all kinds of people. Well, that's of what it felt like. It felt like this is probably not the first email. And when we get those, how do we respond? And we try to respond with empathy, with compassion. And I actually felt bad about it. But part of the, the boundary for me to use Henry Cloud and John Townsend's language was I could spend a day on this. I don't think she's going to be any different at the end of the day. And I'm going to be more anxious and I won't be able to sleep. So here, here, here's another dynamic, right? I don't know how many emails we got. We probably got a thousand messages over the last day or two. I don't know. There's a lot. 99% of them were really positive. But guess what I just did? What I tell leaders not to do. I obsessed over the one. That dynamic. That causes anxiety. And, uh, you know, when I coach people, friends, my wife, you know, who's into a whole new career and all that stuff, I'm like, you file that under the encouragement file and then you go, and I have stuff in my encouragement file, but that real estate from yeah. the one negative voice, the one critic who's at you, it eats at me. What yeah. do I do to minimize? Because you're right. I have allowed that person who I can't change yeah. to occupy my inner space yeah. and maybe even my yeah. space with God. So what do I do about that? Yeah, you, I, I try to figure, I do two things. I, I used to do what you said you used to do, which is, hey, get over it. It's, it's an outbalanced ratio. It's only a few. <laughs> and that didn't work. I was still hurt. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I got to dig deeper. So I dug deeper actually in the last couple of years. This is a newer tool. So the old tool is, okay, what is it in me that I need that I'm not getting from this person? And for mm. me, it's being misunderstood. I, mm. Anytime I don't feel seen, I get anxious. And so knowing that helps me diagnose, why did that email hurt? Oh, it's because she does, she's not seeing me. She's not seeing who I am. And then the next thing I do is I actually allow my anxiety to run for about 30 to 60 minutes. I set a timer because I used to believe the lie that I could stop it. Mm. And then when I couldn't stop it, as you might imagine with my unique field, I would go into a very sophisticated form of shame you're the freaking anxiety guy and you can't stop it. It was that. <laughs> so I thought, okay, what if I let it run rampant for 30 to 60 minutes? So actually on, on my Capable Life website, I filmed a case study on a text I got from a leader saying, we need to meet. Oh, yeah. And on the case Those study, the I read time, the text. Yeah. I got my leader's permission on this and I read the text and it's, we need to meet. It's urgent. And it's about church related matters. And I didn't want to meet before the sermon because I didn't want to infect your sermon. So obviously <laughs> this is, Alarming. Already destroyed. You're already yep. destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Destroyed. And so I went from spun up to calm in 90 minutes. And then we didn't meet for three weeks. I filmed the case study before we met, before I knew what we were meeting about. I, I filmed a case. Here, okay, guys, here's the text and here's how you work my tools. And um, so step number one is I know uh, I always feel like I'm in trouble when I got those texts. That's why I get anxious because I feel like I've done something wrong. Oh, you're going back to like your childhood or something yep. like that. Yep. Yep. Step number two, I let my anxiety run rampant, 30 to 60 minutes. 
And somewhere in there, I, I literally do, this may sound funny, I literally set a timer. I'm like, okay, that's enough of that. But what I'm doing is I'm chasing my anxiety rabbit trails. And so what I did is I had all these crazy fantasies about everything he wanted to meet about. And it was crazy. Seven families are leaving the church. This person's... And what, and then what I do is I get on top of, I'm observing myself like a sociologist. I'm studying my anxious brain and I'm enjoying it. I'm like, wow, man, 25 years of teaching anxiety, you are as crazy as the day you were born <laughs> because, because only one of these options can be true. Most of them contradicted each other. I don't know if you've ever done this, but... Oh, yeah. All right, so that was step two is let myself get anxious and study it. Step three was externalize it. So I grabbed my wife and I said, here's the text I got. I'm really anxious. And we hugged for quite a while, which is on my life-giving list, an mm. elongated hug from my wife. But by naming it to somebody, I now have power over it. I'm no longer in its grip because I've, set, I've confessed it. And that takes a lot of humility. That is a form of confession, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's a yeah. form of confession. And then I pulled out my trusty life-giving list and I did three things on the list, which is jog my dog, which Brody loves that he's on my list. He benefits. Um, talk to God and get outdoors. And I did all three of those at once. And I was out with Brody for about 40 minutes. That's where I'm doing my work on, wait a minute, God's with me. What am I believing? What do I know to be true? I'm believing all these catastrophic things. I'm believing I'm in trouble. What do I know to be true? This leader that texted me is a dear leader in our church. This leader believes in me, loves our church, pours his heart and soul out. That's what's true. What's also true is this leader might have necessary feedback for me that's a gift mm -hmm. about my blind spots. Maybe I have made a mistake. Here's what's true. God's used me with my mistakes before. So I start to let the gospel really infect my anxiety. And then I became excited about the meeting. Man, I'm actually, because you know what? God's going to be in that meeting. And this is a person, I really like this person. Um, now, here's what's interesting, Kerry. So I filmed the case study we meet three weeks later. I got four of those texts over Christmas break. This was one of them. I got four of those texts. And the fourth one, I was vulnerable. And I said, hey, I want you to know, I did really well with three, but this fourth one's going to send me over the edge. Not your fault that you didn't know. But what are we meeting about? It's going to help me to know what we're meeting about. So I just kind of knew my limit, but that was the steps I took. Uh, that to is so it. helpful and so practical. I'm curious, two, two things. One, why didn't you ask him? Because I think I might have done what you did to number four with number one. It's like, yep. hey, I'm going to freak out about this. Why, what yep. are we meeting about? I'd rather Completely know. viable option. Completely oh, it is. Okay, option. so that's not out of, out of bounds. And that's what I did with number four. But, I, you know, obviously in my field, I'm coaching people all the time on this. I, I wanted to, this is such a common thing for church leaders. And here's what I noticed. I've actually surveyed church leaders on Twitter about this very text. Yeah. And, and the overwhelming response is fourth space, the space inside them. Like, so the church leader gets the text and they say, why don't you know how to communicate with me properly? Right. And I wow. wanted to give church leaders a tool that has nothing to do with a messenger because if you've got 2,000 people in your church, heck, if you've got 100 people in your church, you cannot coach everybody on how to communicate with you. That's unreasonable. <laughs> and what, I, what, I, what helped me with this particular person who texted me is this is someone who's for me. We're in the trenches together. Mm. And I still felt the same as the usual suspect critic. I had put him in the same group in my anxiety and that's that to me is like, okay, the tool I need to develop for people has nothing to do with a messenger. Now, what had to happen in this specific case is I asked his permission, can I make a case study in his why? He was mortified. I had no idea. I said, oh yeah, this is what happens with pastors. We're all crazy. He's like, man, well, tell me. And he said, how should I communicate next time? So that happened, but that's I didn't. Fascinating. But I tend to blame. I tend to say, oh, come on, don't you know? You know, I get that. I like when I'm on, I write about it in my next book. Like when I'm on vacation and somebody I barely know texts me, yeah. I'm like, don't you know I'm on vacation? It's like, you don't right. know I'm on vacation. Of course they do. And I no, try to be sensitive about it. I was, I was texting a pastor, a very well-known church, huge church. And I was going to text him with just this, hey, found this really cool article. So I sent him an email privately, just like, hey, I don't know whether this is your day off, but just in case. And he got back to me right away. But like, I feel responsible for that. Like interrupting people's 
peace. And then when people text me at eight o'clock at night and I'm trying to relax with my wife, you know, I'm like, don't text me now. But that's, that's me trying to manage other people, isn't it? Well, I just wanted to show the power of the gospel in your inner mind when you're anxious. Because what's interesting is on Twitter, the majority of the pastors said, well, what you need to do is tell them how to, you know, let them know what it feels like. And I was like, yeah, that's not, it's not that that's not viable, but isn't it better? Like I came home from my life-giving experience completely uh, relaxing into the grace of God. It's also not and, scalable. You can tell him, but you got 2,000 other people who are trying to get to you. That's my point. Yeah. And they're good. And most of them, to your earlier point, most of them are outstanding human beings. Yes. Yeah. And But yeah. what we do is anxiety says to us, they're out to get you. The, the, the imposter syndrome, they're on to you. But what's true is they, like in this guy's case, he kind of forgot he texted me. That's why it took three weeks. <laughs> Because you know what happened? This is what happens, Kerry. What? He was anxious about something. So he, because anxiety is always contagious, he just mm. dumped it on me and then he felt better. Right. It's so off then his it to-do no list and on yours now. Yeah. Yes. So that's, that's another, that's what really happened. And we ended up talking about something that was a challenge that wasn't about me being in trouble. But <laughs> in my mind, it was until I did my work. So, so yeah, um, that would be, that would be something, you know, you're well, trying to, yeah. I think you could hold court here once a month. This is so rich. What I do want to finish on, what I do want to finish on for this episode anywhere, this round, Steve, is because I have thought about that a lot, writing a book over the last couple of years. It's out in the fall. But, you know, one of the points in my new book is that technology has bad manners. Um, (laughs) There is, there is a sense human beings like, and I, I play that scenario where I'm on vacation. If you saw me on vacation, All right. I'm at the beach with my family hanging out, you know, boat nearby with some friends on the beach. And you're like, oh, there's Carrie. I got a question for Carrie. You would have the sense to go, you know what? It looks like he's having fun with his kids and he's going to take him water skiing. And I think I'm going to leave him alone. Right. Like most people, most people, 99 percent, 90 percent of the population would be like, I'm going to leave Steve alone. He's having a good time with his family or, you know, you're at a restaurant you're having a romantic night with your wife. Most people in your church are going to leave you alone. They're not going to come up and, and bug you. Um, yeah. But technology doesn't know that. And I counted up my inboxes. I have 11 inboxes, which is insane. Yeah. So everywhere I look, and this phone goes with me everywhere, right? People are messaging me. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Hey, what about this? What do you think about this? Boundaries for pastors, back to, you know, here we are, we're all working from home. The world is permanently disrupted um, in some way, shape, or form. And we've got inbound all day long. And those texts are coming at pastors, whether it's, hey, we need to meet right away. It's urgent. Didn't want to bug you, but I am now. Um, those kinds of texts to, hey, I've got a cousin whose sister died, needs a, someone to do the funeral, through to about that sermon to, uh, hey, my small group isn't meeting on Wednesday. What should I do, right? You get a million of those. Or entrepreneurs, clients, suppliers. It's that 24-hour connectivity thing. Any thoughts <laughs> on that? Like uh, just, just a really quick softball for the final question. I, I do think, I, I heard a New Testament scholar named Shane Wood say this. He said, you know, our phones, we all carry a mini Tower of Babel around in our pocket everywhere we go. I thought that was an amazing ooh, comment. Ooh, that is good. So I'll, I'll pass that on. That's Shane Wood. Um, I think for, if I can speak to pastors and business leaders, I think you have to check the size of the circle and how many people are in the circle of who can get to you anytime. Mm. And the problem I've run into is twofold, is I have hundreds of people in that circle that each have one thing once in a while. And so that adds up to me having hundreds of things all the time. And then in my early days, I didn't chunk out my calendar. And so I was always reactive with my time. Mm. So I'm a big believer in turning off the inbox while you're doing creative work, vision work, pastoral work. Uh, It's not going anywhere. And, and, and then chunking your time, like, you know, I do think some of these old sages like Eugene Peterson are onto something. Like, no one is going to manage your relationship with God for you. And my opinion, if I can speak to pastors, my opinion is that ministry actually gets in the way of your relationship with God more than it helps it. 
That's oh. a blanket statement, so it's not always true. But not I have true. personally found ministry to be toxic to my relationship with Jesus. Therefore, I need to be more intentional, work harder, and chunk my calendar. Um, and if I don't, I am pulled every which way. Because like you, I've, I've had people actually had the audacity to call me and say, I know it's, I've actually, this is verbatim, I know it's your day off, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm like, and so with that particular person, this is years ago, I said, look, <laughs> let me let you into my world and the world of every pastor I know. It's really hard for me to close the door to the church in my mind. This is my day off. If you open the door, I will walk through it. Mm. And I'm, like, I'm like an addict at the pub. That first drink, I, I'll get drunk. You wow. open the door, I will walk through it. So can you help me? Because I am incapable of staying on this side of the door. That was early. Now I can do it. But the audacity of someone to say that, you know, it's your day off but I don't care. And that's what I, I gave that person is I just let them know, you probably must not understand the tyrannous world a pastor lives in and how hard we fight for the free time we have. Because, you know, I'm, I'm on call 24-7 to probably a couple of hundred people in my life. Yeah. And I'm not going to say no to them, but out of 200, the percentage that ends up in the hospital or, you know, has a loved one with whatever, that my life gets interrupted on a pretty regular basis. And honestly, Kerry, it's a privilege that I get to be, like no question, yeah. that you invite me into your life and let me share in some of the worst moments of your life, that's a privilege. The problem isn't you. The problem is that there's 300 of you. And I don't know how to sift it. So that would be my response. Well, that's, that's fine. You know, this will be another conversation for another day. But you talk about the circles of people. Literally, there's a diagram in the book about the circles of people. Oh, who are wow. the names? Who are the priorities? What is your triage and getting back to people? Feels and, so rude, doesn't it? But it's so necessary. Oh, I, I wouldn't be here. If I hadn't figured that out, I, I oh. would have been swept out to see. Like, that would have been it. It's, it's just too much. And you got to figure it out. And... You have to be prepared to be misunderstood sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Steve, any final thoughts? We're heading into an unstable world. I think you've given us a lot of um, a lot of food for thought. Any any final thought or encouragement or tactic for leaders? Yeah. Look, this may sound self serving, but I would say you have a time management coach. You have a spiritual director. Get get an anxiety coach. For you, your team, and and the reason it's not self-serving is people like Pete Scazzaro do this work, mm -hmm. uh, Rich Velodas, Jim Harrington, Trisha Taylor. There is actually quite a few people that specialize in chronic anxiety. Me too. I'd be honored to work with anyone. But, but you can't navigate this on your own because it's a science and a field that anyone can understand, but you have to be exposed to it. You're not going to intuitively get your way through. So I'd say get an anxiety coach. Um my, my thing, Kerry, is, is when I was a trauma chaplain, you know, the, the gurney would come through the double doors, the person's had the car wreck, they're in the head brace, the EMT's pumping their chest, it's all happening. But then two minutes later, the family shows up and they're so anxious. They just got the call, they've rushed in. And what I learned from that was whatever condition the family was in before the emergency, it, it wasn't the emergency didn't create the crisis in the family. It just exposed it. Mm. What it like, so if there was toxicity, abuse, secret keeping, black sheep, that all just gets heightened. And my job as a chaplain, speaking of name, the dynamic and anxiety in groups, my job was to take about two minutes and figure all that out right on the fly so I could help this family. I, I just would say to people, if 2020 was tough on you, 2020 did not create the situation you're in and exposed it. And I don't say that to make anyone feel guilty or ashamed. I'm just going to say, if you don't do something different in 2021, 2021 will not be different. It will not be different because what 2020 did was give you a gift of an opportunity to dig deeper, figure out some of these tools. Like these are tools that is in a science known as family systems theory. It's been around since 1954. It's an old established theory. Mm. My favorite thing about the theory is it names what we already know. There's very little new I've told you today. I've just named what you've already felt and experienced. Pretty much everything I've talked about with you, Carrie, you have a story for because you've oh. lived it. That's, that's what I love about this theory. So I would, I would say to folks, 
you know, whether it's this theory or Enneagram work or whatever, wherever you find your mental and emotional and spiritual health, be intentional about it this year and, and yeah. you can actually be different. Yeah. And I would just add to that how important it is because anxiety grows as things grow. Like if you yeah. got a problem with 10 people, it's going to be 10 times worse at a hundred. It'll be even worse at a thousand or 10,000. And your character is exposed as things grow. Well, you're just going to lose it because you're, you're, you know, my whole approach, you, you can chart out, this would be an interesting exercise for the future for you and me, but you know, pre-burnout versus post-burnout, which yeah. 30 years of leadership, my life kind of hangs in the middle now, that burnout episode, but it was, it was unscalable. It was just unscalable. And now I'm managing a whole lot more. And it's not like I'm not anxious, but it's like, oh, there's all these strategies that help me figure out what do you do with the person who just emails you because you hit his or her trigger issue, right? Yeah. And and then it's like, oh, I know what to do with that now. Whereas before that could have gripped me for days. So I love Steve, that I, you said that. And I, I hate that I keep interrupting because I'm all excited when I hear you talk and you're trying to wrap this up. But what you just named is so important. It's not that you eliminate anxiety, it's you deepen your ability to manage yours and their anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's your capacity has grown because your burnout wasn't because you had too much to do, it's because you had unaddressed chronic anxiety and these, mm -hmm. these false mm -hmm. needs. And so yeah, I'd leave people with that too, is like your capacity to manage is what grows through this. And that's, that's good news too. And the legacy you leave ultimately is with your family and with the people closest to you. Because if I'm anxious at work because work was oh so bad, then I'm anxious at home and I'm anxious with my kids and I'm anxious on vacation and I'm anxious at night and I'm not sleeping properly and all those things that just about took me out 15 years ago. So this is why I'm so committed and you have an open invitation. You come back whenever you want and uh, you can so just fun. counsel all of us, Steve. <laughs> and uh, some of this is a little bit selfish because I always learn and I always grow with you. So if people want to find you, uh, best website and also where they'll find you on the socials. Yeah, best website is stevecusswords.com. I'm actually launching a seven-day anxiety jumpstart for people who want to try the first space, the space in me. So ah. they can sign up for that. Uh, and then we'll and get it going. It's to reduce anxiety, just to be clear. It's not like you increase your anxiety <laughs> over seven days. I can do that without yeah. you, Steve. No problem. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and then uh, best, best place to find me in this field is on Twitter, which is at Steve Cusswords. Ah, so good. Steve, your gift to so many leaders. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's always a treat, Carrie. Thanks, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.